If we haven't met, I'm Kevin Roberts. I have the privilege of serving as executive director of the foundation. And today I'm joined by two wonderful guests whom I will introduce here momentarily. Just wanted to take a moment and say a word of gratitude for those of you taking an hour out of your time today, what is both a busy week and important week, some of us celebrating Easter. I know many of you having celebrated Passover last week and, and what a, a special time amid these challenges we're facing as a country to come together, at least virtually, and talk about this issue that we're facing. And the issue that we're facing, at least the one that we're going to look at today, is not merely a legitimate health crisis brought on by the coronavirus, but I would argue equally importantly, the economic situation that has resulted from government shutdown at the local level, the state level, the federal level. And our focus today is not so much to question the, the general wisdom of taking some action by the governments, but to provide some steps, some recommendations for steps that all levels of government can take, to, first of all, to reopen this country. And then secondly, as we're dealing with the economic and policy aftermath, perhaps even the social aftermath, what those policies should look like in our state legislatures and in Congress. So joining me today are two special guests, one of them a, a great colleague and good friend, former Congressman John Hostetler, serves as the Vice President for Federal Affairs for TPPF and its DC operation known as States Trust. Congressman Hostetler served in Congress from 1995 to 2007. He was a stellar member of that stellar class of 1994, great Indianan and great colleague, John, thanks for joining us today. Good to be with you. And also our, our other colleague and good friend, Senior Policy Director at the Conservative Partnership Institute, Rachel Bovard. Rachel is someone who helps us significantly as we try to the policy objectives. She herself, one of the, the great luminary, say, conservative. of the policy. John, you, former member of Congress, what do you recommend to Congress right now, sort of a 30,000 foot view, it be focused on in terms of reopening priorities moving forward? Well, Kevin, I'm, I'm getting a little feedback from, um, I guess, the, the, the offset communications between you and maybe the office. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, chime in here on uh, the issues. And uh, what we have uh, is a, a recovery agenda that is the result of several meetings by policy makers and policy uh, experts at TPPF uh, addressing various aspects of the impact of the coronavirus. Uh, the, we, the, uh, the recovery agenda has been winnowed down to about 20 uh, policy recommendations and those policy recommendations um, address four areas, four pillars, if you will, and three of those Three of those um, uh, pillars are for various areas of policy making. The first is the White House or the administration. The second is Congress. Uh, the third uh, are the states. And in those three areas, we have recommendations to those various policy making centers regarding uh, health care and, uh, and a business response. Uh, most of our business response is focused on the, the, the double hit, if you will, that the oil and gas industry, the energy industry in the United States is suffering as the result of the slowdown in the economy from the coronavirus, as well as the conflict uh, that hopefully has been somewhat resolved recently between uh, the Saudis and the Russians with regard to production levels, uh, oil production levels. Uh, the fourth pillar addresses the uh, the genesis of this 
of this uh, calamity, if you will, and that is directed uh, toward uh, the country of China. And uh, we believe that, that it's necessary that we address the fact that this originated in China as the result of the, uh, uh, of the oppression of the Communist Party to a great extent. And that oppression ultimately led to uh, uh, the world being infected uh, because there wasn't, there wasn't sufficient uh, communication between the uh, Chinese government and the rest of the world. If I can, I'd like to go over briefly some of the uh, some of the policy recommendations. For example, from the White House, uh, the first of which would uh, prioritize investment in and waive streamlining permitting process for converting existing refineries to be able to refine American uh, produced oil and gas. Uh, we have in the last year become uh, a net exporter of of oil for the first time in decades. And, and we can continue to exercise energy independence to a great extent if we simply allow for American producers uh, to produce, to refine U.S. Uh, produced products, if you will. We also, we also look at uh, making a permanent sunset. Uh, we asked the, the White House to put in place a permanent sunset or repeal of regulatory authority that's been curtailed in the present crisis. This is an issue that, that uh, folks on the right end of the ideological spectrum, the right of center groups are all, uh, all in chorus together. And that is, uh, if, we, if, we, if we got rid of it or if we curtailed regulatory authority during a crisis, then it would probably be best for the economy generally to sunset that authority and to reduce the impact of the administrative state on the economy uh, in perpetuity. Uh, we also look for uh, an executive order that would enshrine the right to try as a prerogative for all Americans. Right now, right to try is for a very limited number of uh, patients that have, have come to the point in their treatment in, in a life-threatening disease where the, the only alternative they have is for what we might think of uh, uh, as, as that, those type of regimen of medicines that have not completely made it through the regulatory screening process. So we would, we would ask that, that this be expanded for all Americans, especially when we see now the, the lack of ability to get to market and get to the patient, I should say, uh, uh, therapeutic uh, medicines as well, usually a vaccine for the coronavirus. Moving, moving toward the legislative agenda, you might say that the hallmark of our recovery agenda is for Congress to consider and to pass a Workplace Recovery Act. The Workplace Recovery Act would be a much more holistic approach to a national business interruption as we have, as we have faced under, uh, under the coronavirus, uh, more so than, than you might say the more piecemeal approach that's been taken by Congress, understandably, given the situation that, that has been thrust upon them. Uh, then moving on, I don't want to take up uh, too much time. We also ask the states to consider, likewise, a permanent sunset or repeal of regulatory authority that's been curtailed under this crisis for the same reasons that we believe that if, if the federal government did not have to have that into place and it was actually an impediment to progress, uh, the same thing can happen for the states. We also would uh, ask that the states would repeal their state certificate of need laws that prevent hospital construction. One thing we've realized under this current situation is that there, there aren't enough beds for such a pandemic and that sometimes state laws have impeded uh, the ability for states uh, and locales to provide the health care they need. And then finally, with regard to China, uh, these once again are not all of the uh, almost 20 recommendations, but there are a few, and we can talk more about it later in the discussion, but we would seek to, uh, to uh, expand universal and permanent tariffs on goods made in the People's Republic of China by any firm. Um, this is something that has brought uh, China to the negotiating tables in the recent past as a result of President Trump's insistence on these tariffs, and we believe that that it's time for China to become uh, much more open 
and and this may be the only way to get them back to the table to start that open discussion. Chinese government, we started having audio difficulties. So in, in case that that uh, interfered with my introduction of our, our guest and friend, Rachel, Rachel Bovard joins us from the Conservative Partnership Institute in Washington, D.C., where she's the senior policy director. She has significant experience on Capitol Hill, including working for Senator Rand Paul and the Senate Steering Committee. Rachel, thanks again for joining us and would love for you to take first swipe at giving us your assessment, sort of your bird's eye view, perhaps even rather uh, literally, given where you are today in D.C., of what's going on on Capitol Hill up to this point in terms of legislation. And again, from sort of a 30,000 foot view, what do you think Congress needs to be focused on right now? Well, thanks for having me. Um, you know, we at CPI, we've been very focused on sort of what the congressional response should be and what it is. We saw the $2 trillion bill a phase three relief package passed recently. Obviously, there were some good things in there to really help people deal with the crisis that the government you know, has made by forcing people to stay home. But there was an awful lot not to like as well. And that's, we're talking about government pork, we're talking about um, you know, huge excesses in areas that you know, we really didn't need. And so uh, at CPI, we're really focused on um, sort of not letting that happen again, making sure that whatever Congress does is temporary and targeted um, to address just this crisis and nothing more. And obviously not to create an expansion of the state or to make people um, dependent on the government in ways that they wouldn't be um, if we weren't dealing with this current crisis. So Congress is talking about a phase four relief effort. Um, this uh, just as some of the phase three is just taking effect. And so I think we're interested in, in talking to staff and members about maybe pumping the brakes a little bit, letting uh, the current phase three relief effort work you're seeing the Paycheck Protection Act, some Main Street relief effort, and the direct payments to individuals that are only just starting uh, to go through right now. So I think we need to see how that is impacting people before we even talk about a phase four. And then finally, you know, we're really focused on, on preventing Democrats from never letting the crisis go to waste, uh, as they're very eager to do. I think you're already seeing them talk about things like vote by mail, uh, which I think is very troublesome. You know, there may be a need to sort of restructure how we do things in the immediate term, but certainly there's not a need to make permanent lasting changes to how we run elections in this country. Um, they're talking about bailing out the Postal Service. Um, you know, things like that are not necessarily going to be necessary as we go forward to address this current crisis. So uh, those are two areas we're really focused on. And then finally, I think, you know, working with the conservative movement to, you know, as you suggested, balance public health, but also a start moving toward economic recovery. This is not a sustainable situation. The economy is going to have to reopen. So what does that look like? Um, how do we do that in, in perhaps a phased effort that reflects the federalism that's made this country great? And also to push back against you know, the local uh, governments and state governments that have really taken this a little bit too far. You've seen people being arrested for going to church, uh, arrested for driving their cars by just alone. Um, all of that I think is anathema to who we are as a country. We need to keep each other safe, but we also need to balance the things that make us strong. And so those are some of the key areas that we're working on.
uh, uh, mayors as well, really threaten people and threaten not just sort of their, you know, violating for stay at home orders, but really start threaten their freedom of speech, their uh, right to gather for religious purposes. I mean, these are things that are just essential to who we are. We talk about keeping the essential things, keeping the essential workers, but we need to keep our essential rights and liberties. And those I think were really um, <laughs> put to the test in Kentucky this week. Um, but fortunately you saw the federal uh, judiciary intervene and say, this is absurd. You cannot arrest people for simply gathering for a worship service, especially if they're doing it in a socially distant way, like a drive-through mass um, or, or some other socially distant gathering. Um, you know, I think some of the the other states have taken a, more of a lighter hand approach. They've looked at the numbers and said, look, we're going to do what's best for our state. We may, you know, all the models look slightly different in each state, uh, but we're going to focus on, you know, what's best for our people. You know, our peak might be slightly different. We may be able to be, we're a rural community, not a tight urban community. So that, that may reflect how we respond. And that's, I think, you know, what makes sense to a lot of people is um, the fact that federalism here may save us in the end because states and local governments are gonna be able to respond in the best way possible for the, for the needs uh, of their families uh, and communities. Well, I would just echo, I'm, I'm here in Indiana, um, just across the river from catastrophe this disaster and and i would i would just echo kevin what you said at, at the outset of this line of questioning and that is that when i was in congress uh, it was made clear to me from time to time on some relatively important issues uh, the old adage or the i guess the old derivative of the adage uh, don't just do something stand there and what we are doing uh, with regard to to the government response is 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 we are setting a precedent for future activity on the part of the federal government to to greatly uh to to greatly make indebted uh, the next generation the next generations and and i believe that that tppf is going to take be in the forefront of a solution an innovative policy solution to this in the future um, and then that will be the Workplace Recovery Act that we can talk about uh, later that 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 sees this and 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 uses a, a novel approach to address a, a, a pandemic, a national pandemic. Uh, but but it's going to take thoughtful consideration and not, uh, I believe, not two hundred and fifty billion dollars every two or three weeks to solve this problem. And once again, TPPF will, will be in the forefront of, of providing that solution. Yeah, thank, thank you both for your responses. So there we have an assessment of things that have gone well, things that uh, have, have not gone well. Let's, let's home in a little bit on the so-called stimulus legislation number three. Rachel, in that recently passed legislation, what do you think are the best aspects of that? And what do you think are the worst? Well, I think there was definitely a recognition that, you know, the government was the one keeping people out of the job that they were forcing businesses to close. And so there was a little bit of a role for the government to play in responding to that because people were hurt through no fault of their own. So I do think that it was good for the government to step up and, you know, help businesses with small business loans um, to help individual families who were not able to work. And so I do think that that was a warranted response. Obviously, you want these things to be temporary and targeted and not, you know, sustained for too long. But quickly, you know, that package morphed, as it so often does, into a grab bag of, you know, big government, big spending campaign priorities. And so 
you saw the Kennedy Center take $25 million to respond to coronavirus, a bill to keep people employed. They took the $25 million to keep people employed. They've since laid off over a thousand of their workers and they're sitting on a $120 million endowment. So organizations like that had no need uh, for government funding, but got it anyway. You saw a whole host of unrelated priorities. The Forest Service got $3,000 for rangeland research. Uh, a water project in Utah got $500,000. Um, <laughs> a Mitch McConnell campaign priority, the Innovative Sunscreen Relief Act, uh, was included in this bill. So the word sunscreen appears 49 times in a bill to help workers and businesses affected by COVID-19. And so, you know, these are the worst aspects of, of congressional spending. You hope we don't see them again. Um, and I think that at CPI, we're really focused on if there has to be another relief package, which we hope there isn't, and there's no need for one, but if there is, it is temporary and targeted exclusively on the people struggling the most to comply with government mandates. Anything else than that is is too broad, uh, overreach, growing government, and the type of things we do not want to see. Thanks, Rachel. And that's a, a perfect segue, John, to the question I want to ask you, which is about the possibility of another piece of legislation. Number one, do you think that's likely? Will there be another relief package? And number two, if there is going to be, to, to Rachel's point, and if it's going to pass, what do you think needs to be the, the, the priority in terms of specific policies inside that relief package? Well, I, I think there will be a, another relief package. Uh, we don't know if it's going to be um, coronavirus phase four or phase 3.1 or uh, phase 3.375 or whatever it's going to be, but there will be another package recently. The Senate um, uh, considered legislation that would increase uh, the, the Paycheck Protection Act, essentially the, the small business loan program that is that will likely run out of funds by the end of June. Uh, and the, the initial legislative package from the majority leader was approximately $250 billion. And then the, the, the Democrat minority wanted to add another, uh, almost the same on top of that to address some of their priorities. And we saw very quickly a, a Two hundred a quarter of a trillion dollar package potentially morph into another a half trillion dollars in spending less than two weeks after the, the uh, phase three had had uh, had been put in place and and before a single check or direct deposit was was made into a single account of a of, of an American employee. Uh, so I, I would say that that the, the the initial package, the phase three, did recognize the importance of employment and that small business is the backbone of the U.S. economy. And it, it took a while for some folks in Congress and of one ideological stripe to realize that. But, but we want people to get back to work. They, our fellow Americans want to get back to work. And the way they'll get back to work is, is, by, is by a strong employment picture. So, so that, was, that was a bright spot to that, uh, to, to phase three, if you will. In the future, However, given the limitations of phase three's application to, to so-called small business, I think there needs to be a more holistic approach that yes, small business employs uh, probably the greatest number of, of our uh, fellow citizens, but, but, large, but industry, large businesses uh, employ as well, and they are likewise being uh, decimated by, uh, by uh, uh, this, the current situation. So we have to take a more holistic approach. The Workplace Recovery Act that's being proposed by the Texas Public Policy Foundation does that, uh, and and uh, uh, we will continue to push for a more holistic approach to, to address all of the uh, downturn in the economy with regard to employment. Thank you. <clears throat> We're starting to get some questions coming in from the audience, and if you're in the audience and would like to submit a question, just enter that in the comments box below the live stream feed. One, one question for, for both of you before we get to the first audience questions is kind of moving chronologically to the fall and picking up on something you mentioned, Rachel, about the election. There are widespread calls now to do the entire election in November by mail. Could you give us the pithy response of why that's such a bad idea? Two words, voter fraud. <laughs> uh, 
That is why we do not want to see vote by mail. Yeah. Um, you know, you saw President Trump touch on this a little bit in one of his press conference recently. Um, but, you know, this is the left has been pushing for these things for years because they benefit from the voter fraud because they've just been practicing at it for years. Um, but this is, you know, something that we need to talk about because, you know, we don't want people to gather in groups right now. That's something that's a public health priority. We don't know where we're going to be in November. Uh, so I think it's a little bit hasty uh, in April to make the determination that we need to fundamentally restructure our elections. But more than that, none of the ways they've been asking for this are a temporary and targeted response to just this virus. Um, they permanently change the way we do elections in America, which is completely unwarranted. Um, civic participation is something that we prize in this country that's going to the polls um, and doing so you know, with care but to make sure that's one person equals one vote. Um, and this completely turns that on its head. So this is something I think the conservative movement is pretty united against. And I think President Trump is as well. And so if Democrats want to go to the mat for it, it's their funeral. <laughs> I love that. John Hostetler, surely as a six-term member of Congress, you had some brushes with voter fraud. Oh, I, 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 I couldn't agree more with what with what Rachel said. It, it is a, it is a, 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 it is a prescription for voter fraud. And the fact is, we're so uh, we're so far away from November that so many things are going to be different in November. Excuse me. <coughs> That, that, that's an allergy-related cough and, and not any other cough. Um, things are going to be so different by November. And even if they aren't that much, uh, our, the integrity of elections in our union are worth, uh, are worth our showing up to vote. And, and, and they are worth delaying an election, if necessary, in order to show up for that vote. So I, 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 I can just tell you, I, I cannot think of a, a, a more uh, disastrous outcome of this, of this coronavirus uh, pandemic that we're in than to see the, the, the vote eroded and our liberties eroded as a result of doing this, this thing. Yeah, great, great response. Those are the very reasons that caused us two months ago to start a voter integrity initiative, which is headed up by a former member of Congress as well, Francisco Canseco. And that's right now focused here on Texas, but obviously there are opportunities all across this country to be fighting voter fraud. So we hope to expand it. So to keep this focused on, on the theme of our conversation today, which is to make America work again, let us take the first couple of audience questions and, and just reading them here. They look like they're focused on this. And I'll, I'll pitch to you, John, about the specific question, but then Rachel will follow up with you with uh, kind of a, seeking a general comment about small businesses. And, and the question for you, John, is about this idea of the Workplace Recovery Act, which you were talking about. Of course, we're working on that with our good friends at CPI. And the question is, will the Workplace Recovery Act help small businesses that don't have a large revenue? Yes, it will. Uh, the, the Workplace Recovery Act uh, summarized basically uh, addresses uh, expenses, operating expenses, if you will, holistically of a of a business. Whereby, when uh, the the policy would buy would be that the federal program, the federal loans would cover the differences between uh, current revenues and uh, and and historical revenues to the extent of 90% of the difference would be, would be made up by, by payment of this type of ins new insurance program, if you will. And it would help small businesses. It would help large businesses. And, and as a res result of that, as a result of addressing operating expenses and seeing what every business um, that's, uh, that is operating at this time under the conditions that they find their, their own business, it would be it would be not a one size fits all. It would be tailored to the particular business, and it would use the infrastructure in place currently in our in the insurance industry. And so it would not be a, a government program as such, but it would be administered by the by the insurance industry, which 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 is much better at at 
the relationships with individual businesses than than the United States government is. Question, although I may have a specific follow up uh, regarding a question from one of our audience members, and and that is. When you look at the, the appropriate response for for small businesses by the government, how how can we as conservatives get comfortable so quickly with what can be perceived as a big government response? Well, I think you have to look at the nature of this crisis that we're living in, because, you know, up until now, the last sort of touch point that we had for this type of activity was TARP which was you know, a billion dollar bailout of the banking industry after the banking industry cratered the economy. And there's a lot of moral hazard involved in that. Uh, not a lot of punishments meted down on an industry uh, for, for doing the wrong thing. And so rightly, many conservatives were concerned about that. Um, but I think this is a little bit different because the government is responding to a crisis of its own making. Um, people are being hurt through no fault of their own. People who want to work cannot. Um, and businesses are being forced to close their doors uh, almost by government mandate to comply with government public health orders. And so I think the nature of it's a little bit different, but the principles remain the same in that you do not want this you know, big government permanent uh, state expansion in a response. And I think that is what conservatives really need to be focused on. There is a danger here you know, that we already did this, right? That we, in the way that the last relief effort was, uh, was structured, we actually incentivized people to take the unemployment by, give, by giving them $600 on top of the 100% of their wages. And you're already seeing businesses struggle with this because the way that the loans are structured, they can only get forgiveness of, of the payroll portion or you know, most of it will be focused on the payroll portion, but they can't keep people employed because obviously their employees wanna go get a raise on unemployment. And so that's the type of incentive that you wanna prevent. And that's what I think the government needs to be very careful about because government's not good at this isn't the role of government, um, but it is right now because of the public health crisis we're in. So we need to make sure we get it right. Yeah, I've heard from so many business owners here, mostly here in Texas, but also a few around the country who say, even if they can, can are allowed back to, to work in early May, they have a hard time getting their employees back because they're making so much money on unemployment. Right. So John, a question for you, and, and that is, have, have you in any news stories or in any other um, sources that you've observed seen small businesses, particularly new ones that may not have a lot of years of, of paperwork, uh, accounting and so on, struggling to meet some of the paperwork requirements to benefit from these programs? Yes. And the way that the, the program is set up uh, to that, you have to contact the government, you have to make application uh, to the government and sometimes, uh, and also through banks uh, that uh, are not necessarily set up for this type of um, uh, uh, of coverage, you might say. And so, and so, uh, even established businesses are struggling to meet the requirements uh, of of the Paycheck Protection Act in order to uh, obtain the loans. And so, um, this is the nature of a a government program that is that is set up without much thought going into it, reacting to a, a crisis that is that is growing uh, almost exponentially, uh, and and that why that is why there is a need for an, another type of program to address this in the future, a, a program that is based on, for example, an industry that is accustomed to doing exactly these type of operations. Uh, and, and has relationships already uh, in industry that uh, for, for these type of, of operations. But, but yes, uh, paperwork is, is a significant problem. And there are people that, that are trying frantically to make it by the deadline. And you, you hear of the, the horror stories of staying on the phone for 12, 13 hours in order to keep your place in the queue sometimes. Um, but, but, but that is what is happening as a result of this program. Yeah, it reminds me of, of a comment that Rachel made a few moments ago that this just isn't the job of government. Government's not going to do a good job with it as a result. And Rachel wondering sort of in a similar vein, have we seen, particularly at the state or local level in the temporary relaxing of, of certain regulations 
some examples of regulations that are getting in the way of, of business productivity that ought to just stay off the books. Yeah, I think this is a big area of, of something we've learned from this crisis, right? Because they've, the federal government and state governments have relaxed a ton of regulations that were impeding uh, rapid response efforts. And the logical question is, well, why were those there in the first place? We don't need them now. How vital are they actually? And so I think this is going to pre present a really good opportunity for us to actually take a good look at the, at the regulatory state and maybe start to have good arguments about really how to pull, pull some of it back. I think the first place to start for a lot of people is going to be the public health regulations because you saw them hold up actually the virus response from the CDC and the FDA. You saw huge slowdowns in you know, testing, um, in vaccine development. All these things need to be relooked at because it was the heavy hand of government that was preventing a rapid public health response, not anyone else. I mean, the country mobilized quickly and that's a credit to Americans. It's not credit to the government. Uh, so I think you need to take a second look at that uh, for sure. Um, and then there's a whole host of regulations also on telemedicine that we saw somehow lifted, which made, I think, you know, was common sense to a lot of people. Why shouldn't we be able to, to utilize telemedicine more effectively? And so I think that's going to be another area where you're going to see a lot of deregulatory efforts going forward. Obviously, with the appropriate cave caveats around the pro-life area and end of life as well. Uh, but those are some key areas, I think, in the public health space that regulations maybe didn't make a lot of sense and actually made things worse, uh, we can start to roll those back permanently. In, indeed. One of our audience members has asked a question about new businesses, it's sort of a two-part question. One is about waiving fees. I think we've sort of addressed that with your response just now about regulation. But the other aspect of this question from the audience is, will there be perhaps in, in relief package number four, if that happens, what this audience member terms a hand up for new businesses that be, will be created during or after this crisis. John, you want to field that question? Well, I I believe that's that's pretty forward thinking, pretty forward looking, uh, and that's not something necessarily that the government is very good at. Uh, but that's but that's a that's a, a great perspective to have because as we've seen uh, concerns that are valid, that that businesses are going to go away, the market is not going to go away. The market for those products and services are not going to go away. And so it'll be incumbent upon, it will be incumbent upon the government, uh, I think, that has created this vacuum to attempt to fill the vacuum. Uh, I didn't think I'd ever hear myself say something like that, but, uh, but as Rachel has pointed out, uh, very clearly, this is of the government's making. Even I believe to, to a certain extent, this is my perspective uh, as a result of being there when it happened, our, our relaxing on, on China in, in the economic sphere and in the, in the tariff uh, issue when we gave them permanent normal trade relations from an annual review of most favored nation status. So the federal government has created the situation in which we find ourselves in. Uh, on many levels, uh, and and it's going to be up to the government to start being more forward-looking as to as to what impact it's going to have when it makes these decisions. Thanks, John. So, a couple of questions for me, and and as we wait for the question queue from our audience to fill back up, and one of them is if if you had the ear of President Trump, let's just say he he called you this afternoon, Rachel, and he said. Give me some guidance, please, on how we open up this country over the next two to four weeks. What would your step-by-step -step recommendation be? Well, I think the first thing he needs to do is, is really just, I think, give the states a little bit more of a boost, right? The states have all this power, um, but they need to, I think, feel comfortable with the federal government, you know, saying, hey, do what's best for your state, do what's best for your community, do what's best for your local government, because I think right now all the governors and and my boss Senator Demint has pointed this out. All the governors are trying to like out fear each other, right? They're they're shutting their states down. You know, I'm in Virginia. We're shut down until June, which seems somewhat arbitrary, right? And so I think you know for the president to say, look, public health is is of the utmost importance here, but we need to have a, an appropriate balance, and that's going to look different. It's going to look different on the in the Northeast as it as it does down in Texas as it does in the West Coast, and so. I think a boost of that message from the White House, I think, would be very important right now because um, I, I think everybody's 
uh, uh, still a little bit operating under the assumption that, you know, if, they, if they're not closing till July, they're not doing it right. And that's just simply not true. Yeah, that's, that's right. J John, anything you would add? Well, I, I would just echo that. And, and uh, one thing that, that I've been very impressed with, with this president on this approach, and that is, and I haven't seen all of his uh, briefings. I haven't read all of the reports on, on what he said or maybe tweeted on the issue, but, but I, found, I find it refreshing that he is, he is not mandating closure of our economy. If you look at where, where the essentially closure orders are coming from, they're from, as Rachel pointed out, Virginia, they're coming from Kentucky, they're coming from, uh, to a great extent, New York. Obviously the tragedy in New York City is, is, uh, is, is very, uh, very sad. But the president of the United States is recognizing that, that the federal government must exercise some restraint to realize that, that not every state is, in, is going to be, their issues are going to be solved by a top-down uh, approach. And, and I, would, I would, if I had his ear, I would simply uh, one tell him that I applaud his restraint. I, I'm not sure, I'm not sure an, another president in our recent past would have done the same thing, uh, uh, really of either party. But, but he is showing tremendous restraint, allowing the states to, to deal with the unique situations uh, within their borders, and, and, but playing a supportive role, uh, especially with regard to the CDC and, and the, the, the health concerns uh, th that he's been, that the federal government has provided. Uh, and that I would just simply say, uh, uh, continue doing what you're doing with regard to allowing the states to lead on this. Uh, it's really, really good emphasis. Of course, for, for the three of us, that's that's sort of uh, how how we see the world and and thinking about the different categories of state responses. They they, they fit pretty neatly into red or blue states, and it, it really does speak to someone's worldview, particularly their view about the the proper role and, and function of government. I'm thinking here in Texas, we're we're blessed in many respects to have Greg Abbott as our governor, and he made news over the weekend by emphasizing that this week, his team, in addition to continued fighting the, the virus in particular, was also going to be focused on economic recovery. And I'm, I'm just reading from a press conference that happened just before we went live. And Governor Abbott said, quote, this is not gonna be a rush the gates, everybody is gonna be able to open all at once situation. So what he's signaling, and I guess he's going to be announcing something or more details later this week, is how we can phase back in to recovering. Here in Texas, it's crucial, not just because of the effects of the virus, but because we also know that our, our friends in the oil and gas industry, not just folks who own companies, but, but guys and gals who work at those companies are, are deathly afraid of how the Russians and Saudis have been, and perhaps others, playing with the market. And that's, that is a significant threat to the state budget here in Texas. And that's a, a tremendous statement to make considering the prosperity that we were all enjoying going into this virus. So I think it's really important to underscore this message that each of you has made that we, we give states the leeway that they need, that they ought to have properly, as we know from our understanding of federalism. And it sounds like Governor Abbott is, is certainly taking that to heart. Next question is from the audience, and we'll start with you, Rachel, and, and then uh, pitch to you, John, as well. Do you have any words of encouragement for us small business owners trying to make all this work? Well, God bless you, because you are on the front lines of it in ways that the rest of us can only imagine. Um, you know, I hope that the Paycheck Protection Act is starting uh, to trickle down and be effective for you all. Um, it, the banks should have guidance for it to implement it going forward. Um, and I think that that will be helpful. Congress is trying to respond with a little bit more money for that program. Um, Republicans tried to pass that last week and were blocked by Senate Democrats um, who have a list that they would like to attach to that as well. Um, but you guys are on the front lines and and I my heart goes out to you because this is something that I, I don't think any of us could have even imagined. Um, <laughs> I said recently that I'm sorry for all the bad things I said about 2019 because 2020 has been <laughs> A roller coaster since then, but um, you know, to the extent that you can get access to those funds for the Paycheck Protection Act, that's what it's there for. Um, please use it. 
Uh, this isn't, again, a betrayal of our principles. I think right now as we're in this crisis, it is a temporary and targeted program and I hope you all use it. I hope it's effective. Yeah, <laughs> John? And, and I would, I would echo, echo that as well as um, simply say that the individual that asked the question, your level of engagement as a result of taking part in this event, uh, I hope informs us all that we have got to be engaged and we've got to be more engaged because we, we didn't get here as the result of something that was not completely um, uh, a surprise. Uh, you know, policy decisions that were made decades ago have, have brought us to the point we, we are today and this administration has had m most of this foisted upon them as a result of previous lack of attention or uh, misattention to various policy issues. Uh, I would say, uh, once again, uh, work with your members locally, that your uh, members of the House, your senators, they have constituent services uh, personnel that are there to help for just such a time as this. Uh, and then secondly, once again, stay engaged. If this is the beginning of your engagement in the, in the process of, of policy as a result of the, its impact on your, on your livelihood and your families and your friends and your uh, employees, uh, if that's what's got you, gotten you engaged, just please continue to be engaged. That, that's so true. So two final questions, one from the audience, and then, then I'll, I'll take the privilege of asking you the last one. And this question from the audience, I'll just read verbatim. Why not go back to the Constitution with regard to getting America back to work? Trust the people to pursue their rational self-interest and pursuit of happiness. That's what made this country great. Provide information, guidelines, and suggested protocols, but also trust companies, institutions, and individuals to do the right thing. Just as with our history, I believe the health and economic outcomes would be optimized. John, you want to take first crack at that? Well, um, I don't know why I have to, uh, because <laughs> it is so uh, it is so pointed and so correct. I I am a constitutionalist myself, a student of of the foundational law, and and I agree with you, and and to a great extent, I I would have had a different perspective of this had I not realized, once again, that in my understanding that the federal government did have a significant role, uh, a primary role in putting us where we are today, not just with, with regard to the shutdown of our economy, but, but with what brought us to this point. And uh, if, you, if, you don't, if you need any more proof of that, just ask the people in Northern Italy uh, what, what the impact of China's uh, international economic designs have have led there. Uh, so, so I believe that the federal government has brought us here. I believe that, that the, states are, uh, the states are demanding certain things and in the word of the, the constitutional lawyers and uh, there's, there's takings that are, taking, that are going on. That is the government is taking uh, economic benefit from its citizens as the result of these various orders. So I, I believe that in this unique situation, the federal government and the state governments have played a key role in putting us where we are today. And unfortunately, we're going to have to collectively and politically bring ourselves out of it. Once again, however, when we stay engaged, hopefully we will not be doomed to repeat this. Thank you. Rachel? Yeah, I think it's a great point uh, that, that the Congressman made because what is going to bring us out of this crisis is not the federal government. Um, that will certainly help support us through it, but it's going to be the creativity, the ingenuity of the American people with the spirit that's made us strong. And that I think always goes back to the heart of what the constitution is about. But I do think that it's going to be incumbent upon policymakers when this is over to look back and see what got us here. Because this is a crisis in many ways of our own making. And I think particularly when we look at China, we have now come to the conclusion that China is actually the supervillain that we've been warned it is. Um, we have seen this in so many ways um, from the way that they uh, attempted to hide this virus from the world. They stole weeks and months of preparation from the world before they made us all sick. Um, we have to, there needs to be a reckoning with our policies, both foreign and domestic, as we move forward 
so that we never find ourselves in this situation again. We may face a global pandemic again, but we need to be prepared both federally and at the state level to ensure that we never have to suffer uh, an economic crisis of this magnitude along with a public health crisis. So that's gonna be incumbent on our policymakers when they return to work. Yeah, Rachel, I wanna give you a virtual high five. That's, that, that, <laughs> that, that was, was the bullseye, thanks so much. So we just have a few moments left. So we'll sort of consider this one question, the lightning round. And it's a little bit of an unfair question because policy people like the three of us are really good at analyzing the past and, and figuring out what to do in the present and the near term. We're not as good about forecasting into the future. And I'm just curious, it's a crystal ball question. When do you think life returns to normal? Well, um, I'll take that because I don't have sense. <laughs> I don't you. have sense <laughs> enough not to. Um, <laughs> um, I, I think I think it, it will probably be mid June to early July is whenever we see that that other end of the bell curve um, brightly shining on us. Which which once again this is this is John Hostetler's uh, opinion, but I, I believe the things like um, changing the nature of our elections. I think in, in by mid-June to early J July, we are going to have a totally different picture of where we will be in November, for example. And, and, and I think that, uh, that if we will, uh, I, I know that they're considering that the, the DC metro area of Philadelphia, there, there may be some growing concerns in some other metropolitan areas uh, similar to what's taking place in New York. But I think, uh, but I think by mid June to early July, we'll see the light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah, I think what's going to be really important is that every day looks a little bit different. So I think it's actually really hard to make these sort of very long term judgments because I hope that people, um, you know, take Virginia for an example. Our governor's closed the state until June tenth. Well, I would hope that he would be looking at the data every single day watching it as it changes, maybe being willing to revise things, um, you know, if things get better. And that's what I would really hope our public officials, uh, instead of making these grand statements, because again, they can't see the future, they would really watch the data as it comes in. Is it as bad as it was expected? Is it worse? Is it better? And making judgments around that. So um, although I will say on a personal note, I'm supposed to get married in October. So I really hope that the country's <laughs> open in time for that, because I would be really sad to have to... Get, get married on Facebook Live. <laughs> <laughs> we, we will keep that in our prayers for you, Rachel. That's right. Thank Look, you. This, That's right. this has been a wonderful hour to thank the two of you and, and, and our audience for tolerating our technical difficulties today. No doubt it's because we were criticizing the Chinese government. <laughs> of course, we love Chinese people here and abroad. Uh, but Rachel, before we wrap, I just want to give you an opportunity to tell our audience members where they can learn more about the Conservative Partnership Institute. Well, you can find us on the web at conservativepartnership.org and then on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook as well. You'll see Excellent. us there. And, and John Hostetler, I'll, I'll say your piece for you, which is that you can go to texaspolicy.com to learn more about us. If you're interested in this last thread that we were emphasizing, which is, of course, in the spirit of making America work again, didn't say it specifically, but we have some trouble, as you might imagine, with these consistently inconsistent models about the pandemic when we know that unemployment numbers are very real. You can go to texaspolicy.com slash dashboard, which is a, a dynamically updated subpage that shows you the virus reality as well as the economic reality. And I can tell you that if we wanna make America work again, we need to be spending a lot more time focused on the latter. Thanks so much for joining us. May God bless you. May he God bless Texas. And of course, may he God bless America. Thank you.